today's topic, and we have many others in other webinars, the two V's, V and V, I nickname them, verification and validation. The simulation analyst has built a model to verify. And that is largely something the analyst does in his or her own boudoir. It is very analogous to debugging in the traditional computer programming sense. Does the model do what I think it does and intended that it do? That's all very well. However, does the model accurately represent the real system that the client wants to design, build, modify, improve? What is the real system doing now that may need improvement? Or what will the real system do if built according to the specifications currently in the mind of the client. The model must match those expectations of the user. And getting that match is called validation. So verify and validate are very closely related, but nevertheless distinct. Verify comes first and validate involves the client much more intimately. There has never been, and I don't think there ever will be, a successful simulation project that got that way without extensive client involvement. And it is largely the responsibility of the simulation analyst to encourage that involvement. A marvelously theoretically correct simulation model that is not trusted enough to put its recommendations into management action might never have been built at all for all the good it ever does. So we do verification first. Did we build the model right? Validation. Did we build the right model? The right model is the one that represents the client system in all important performance aspects. And having done those two, has the model achieved credibility? Does the decision maker, <clears throat> that will be our client, trusted enough to base management decisions on the results that come out of that model. So we'll look first at some verification techniques. This one comes from what might be called traditional computer science, certainly heavily emphasized in the literature and in computer science university curricula. <clears throat> Do not build just one big, huge, humongous program that likely has errors in it someplace, goodness knows where. Build a program, as this clip art clearly implies, of small pieces, each of which can be checked and tested quickly reliably and independently, and then put the pieces together. Now, after a simulation model is built and ready for its first test run, I always insist, I do a great deal of mentoring at PMC, and I teach, I'm currently teaching a university graduate class in simulation let only one entity into the model. Every simulation software package on the market now readily allows about one or two mouse clicks that capability. 
if it didn't, it would have been driven into extinction, extinction by the competitors long ago. Let one entity into the model and watch it step by step. Does it go where it should at the simulation time it should? Remove all randomness. A working simulation model that the client is going to use as a basis for business decision typically involves a great deal of randomness. Customer arrival, service times, workers out sick, supply chain delays. Oh, I heard a radio transmission from another planet where they don't have supply chain delays. They don't have ships that get stuck in canals sideways, but we've got supply chain problems here on this planet. Downtimes, how often do they occur? How long does the repair take? Ship changes, change over times on machines, travel times, delays, so there's going to be randomness in the map, but not for the first test. Take the randomness away, away just for a little while, not permanently. Replace all the random distributions with constants. Look at the results and check them against a pocket calculator. Do they match? They must match before the modeler goes any step forward and double check the array subscripts. Simulation software, like practically any software or computer language, allows for arrays with rows and columns. Visualize an Excel spreadsheet. The row might be one particular sale. The columns might be the customer name, the customer telephone number, the customer address, the amount of the sale. So each row has a particular significance. Each column has a particular significance that it better be well understood by everyone working on the model. A commercial size model is going to need more than one modeler. The user needs to understand it to interpret any output displayed this way. <clears throat> and I insist to my mentees, don't ever let a model get away from your desk without the documentation of what the row and column subscripts mean. They don't ever go negative, do they? They'd better not. Now, certain things just don't happen. Ships don't hit icebergs because the captain watches for them. But if it can't happen, set up a trap door. I will not let one of my mentees write code. Here it's pseudocode. It would be written slightly differently in different simulation software packages but I will not allow code like the left-hand column because that's just assuming that J equals two. Well, of course, J has to be equal to one or two. I've heard that hundreds of times in my 40 years of simulation. Well, just in case it isn't, have an error trap. And if you ever get here, You've got wonderful debugging information, just where to go to find the trouble. Now, if the arrival rate goes up, the queues should get longer. If the cycle time goes up, the machine utilization should go up. There's a simulation clock in all simulation software now. It had better not try to run backwards. And if it does try, all the simulation software on the market now will immediately stop the model and bring up an error message 
with a red border or a big red X on it or something like that. And I often quote to our clients, a common tool used by auditors teaching in the College of Business as I do at the University of Michigan. I often have occasion to talk casually with professors of business ethics and business auditing. And this is one of the most, their most common canaries in the coal mine. Why does our raw material usage keep going up, but we aren't getting any more throughput? Well, maybe it's leaving the plant in the workers' lunch boxes. So things like that have to be checked. Now, bullet point one, the US government lost one of its missions to Mars. One set of engineers was using meters and the others were using yards. Whoops, same for distance units. An entity, that's something that enters the model. A car to be assembled, that's what I did at Ford. A patient entering the emergency room, that's a big usage of simulation. And PMC among our clients. A truck pulling into the warehouse loading bay, that's a big one nowadays, a customer coming into the bank or store or restaurant. It's one thing I like about PMC, I get to work on projects in many more contexts now, but in all of those in their respective models are entities. An entity had better not just disappear unless intended and documented. And after doing years and years of simulation, as Brian mentioned, PMC has been in business a good long time. We have a library. Let's reuse it. The components are verified. Model can be built quicker. Client is happier. All to the good. Now, after the model is run a while, Every part of the model should have visits from entities. If not, why not? Better find out. And we have taken a leaf from the airlines. Whenever there is a dangerous situation, a near miss at an airline, a complete log is taken. What went wrong? How can that be prevented from happening again? We have tucked away in the office a logbook of here's errors that have been made in the past. Some of them are mine. There's some there from 15, 20 years ago. They're in the logbook to be checked. So we don't repeat them. So those are some splendid ideas. for verification. Now that you're verified, let's look at validation techniques. We're bringing in the client users even more now. Wrong way. Oh, thank you for this specification. I'll take it away and build the model. Don't call me, I'll call you. Wait a few weeks and I'll call you up when it's done and you can look at it. Absolutely not. We confer early and often, as the old Mafia Dons used to say, vote early and often with the subject matter experts, and they're the ones of the client. Are things going as expected? What's going on this week? Have we run into any problems or delays? What questions do we have of you? What questions do you have of us? Here's what we expect to do in the next week. The communication channel is always open. Now, some important data issues in validation, and some of these come up in even more detail in a statistical sense, 
in another webinar we run on statistical analysis of simulation input. The first one, whoops, we called a client on that early before it became a problem or caused a delay. Data having errors in it, inconsistent units. Now the first four are very common. The fifth bullet point is rarer, but it does occur. And when it does occur, if none detected, it's worse. For example, the department supervisor of a bunch of machines in the factory understates the amount of downtime that those machines experience because he or she does not want top management to realize the neglect that's been accorded to preventive maintenance. It's amazing what preventive maintenance will prevent. That would be data biased due to selfish interests. It had better be uncovered and the earlier the better. So structured walkthroughs go in a meeting room. The modeler narrates his or her way through the model and the peers play devil's advocate. Now the model passes this step when all peers, not a majority, sign off on its validity. The great pioneer in this was Weinberg in a famous book, The Psychology of Computer Programming. Weinberg had four levels of peer vote after a structured walkthrough, except as is, except with minor changes that we trust the modeler to make, except with major changes, the modeler will make the changes and then we need another review or reject. This is such a mess, we'll throw it away and start another one. And the winning vote is the minimum vote, not the majority vote. And if one of our new hires questions this, I speak about what happened at Troy. A beautiful wooden horse appeared. The inhabitants of Troy were overjoyed, all but one. Finally, the Greeks have gone away. We've won an enormous victory. We shall drag this trophy horse they left into the city and drink the night away in celebration. There was one pessimist named Lao Kong. I don't trust the Greeks. They might be hiding. I think there's something fishy about that horse. Let's not celebrate yet, but let's have soldiers guard the horse overnight. That was the minority vote of one. The Trojans banished him from the city and had a grand celebration. And then, now the Turing test, and this is named after the famous British logician and mathematician, Alan Turing. He was a major factor in winning World War II because he broke the German codes. The Turing test goes like this. You get some results from the real system if it already exists. This test won't work in the less common case where the real system is under design, not built yet. You get some results like machine utilization, queue lengths, queue times, throughput from last week on the real system. You get the matching numbers out of the simulation model. You don't label them, but you show them to the user side by side. And you ask the user which is which. And then you look at bullet point number two. Oh, you could tell them apart. How? 
why it's obvious. In my manufacturing line, there's always a big backup of the drill press. But the results on your sheet of paper show only a minor backup there. Well, the model just flunked the Turing test, and we now have a valuable clue what's wrong in the model near the drill press. And by the time the Turing test is passed, there's going to be a lot more credibility in the client's mind. And statistical analysis, indeed, we have another webinar on statistical output methods for simulation. These are the key points. Enough replications, multiple runs of the model with different random number seeds, terminating versus steady state. And if it's steady state, is the warm up period su sufficiently long to eliminate startup bias? In the model, we very likely use distributions like exponential, gamma, Weibull, log normal to represent randomness. Did we pick distributions that are a good fit to the empirical data, which has come and will come out of the user's system? There's heavy duty statistical tests to do that. And be very careful of something like this. Even as common a distribution as the exponential has two common parameter variations, depending which textbook or reference book you open up. So as I tell our new hires, you know, paraphrasing, do you know where your children are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know which form your software uses? Better find out. It's in the documentation. And here are some additional techniques. All assumptions are written down. In meetings with the client, we agree upon them. And the client signs off on them. The client looks at the model animation and agrees that it looks reasonable. Animation will not find all errors, but it will find a good many, some of them the more obvious ones. Is the model as complex as required? But no more so. And in cases where the model is reasonably close to queuing theory out of a textbook, are the model results reasonably close to what's predicted by the formulas in the textbook? So credibility has to be earned and validity is something you build in. It's not something you add on at the end with a paintbrush. 